Hey there, Dango Stu here. Today's video is about installing the Raymarine Quantum 2 radar into Renko and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. We're still waiting to get on the hard stand, unfortunately, but I do have a date now, which is Thursday in a few days' time. The upside to this is it gives me some time to go through and edit up some old footage from before we left. This is John and I working together to install the radar onto Renko. First step was to remove the old bracket from the original radar and then start making a new one for the Raymarine Quantum. Okay, we've got our four holes drilled now on the mounting plate. Two other parts, this threaded here is for a safety lanyard, so it can be uh, tethered to the mount if it's unbolted to do something, whatever. Um, this is actually a port, it's a one-way port, so moisture can drain out but not get in. So if ever kind of humidity ends up inside the unit for some reason, shouldn't, but this allows it to drain. So there needs to be a hole on the plate to allow this to drain. If this is just covered up by the plate or too close, no good. Rule of thumb is enough space so you can fit your finger in underneath it. All right, here's our tracing. Uh, now, let's make sure we don't get our upside downs and fronts and backs confused. Ugh, that was loud. What I'd really like to do here is drill this with a hole saw big enough to just cut into the edge. I think it's going to look really weird if it just almost comes to the edge or something. Not that it really matters, but you know. For once in my life, I might take aesthetics into consideration. Be nice doing the drill press, but all the hole saws are on the boat. Okay, let's figure out how we're going to do our gussets. So gussets are going to go on like this. Measuring stick. What have we got here? 300. Let's go 150 centre. Let's go 30 mil that way. What's this roughly there? Uh, let's call it 50 mil, which is what that one's at. Let's call this one 50 mil. 250. So I'm going to mark this line, grind the line off, <laughs> remark the line. Paint pens, you gotta love them. They're really dry until you press down and then they just make a big pro heart style blob. Could be the operator, I guess. Stranger things have happened. All right, flap disc. Ah, no, I took both grinders to the boat too. Oh man. Both the uh, little grinders are on the boat. So we'll just clean this up with the nine inch and a cutting disc. Let's not be that dodgy. Oh, man, this hasn't been undone in a long time. Luckily, grinders share a spindle size. Having finally got a uh, grinding disc on this uh, grinder, <laughs> now realise the uh, brushes are completely stuck, it's not working at all, so we'll have to free those up, get this thing going. It's going to be easier than going out to the boat to get another grinder. Oh, totally jammed. Salt water. Mm, there we go. Interesting, it's got like a roll spring rather than a coil spring. It's kind of cool. Plenty of meat left on the brushes. I'll just get this sort of oxide corrosion layer off, then they should move just fine. Come on, grinder, work one more time. Actually, quite nice uh, grinder to service, to be honest with you. Quality brushes, good quality spring, plenty of meat, good access. Thank you, Makita. Okay, just got our two endpoints marked again. Now we've ground the line off. Uh, weld one, then the other. Well, tack one, weld it right out. Then I'll put the other on. The second one's gonna be a bit harder because of the angle. 
I keep thinking I should put my welding jacket on, but I haven't really worn it for a while. I'm not sure I want to deal with that right now. Oh, cricket. Should give that to Daffy. I don't know a lot about welding, but one of my favorite things is when slag falls off on its own. To give myself half a chance of drilling this, I'm gonna tack weld it to this plate uh, instead of trying to clamp it. I've gone an oversized hole saw that kind of gets us down to here. It's gonna deflect. I don't know, go slow, see what happens. Hole saw's bottoming out here, so I'm just gonna cut that off with the angle grinder and keep going. Okay, so it came out pretty well. Just gotta grind these little uh, dags off from the tack welt, but it's a pretty nice fit. I also had to weld some small tabs on so that it could attach to the mast and not be flopping around. You can see here there's also a shorter pipe that's going to be going on the back deck when we get to Bundaberg. That's going to be for things like the water outlets and the water tank breathers. Um, just putting a string through my pipe. Then I'm going to use the string to pull the cables through because I want to have that run when I weld it and I don't want to risk melting the string and it breaking. So we'll get two wires through each of the uh, openings and uh, get it in place. A bit of wash always makes welding interesting. Just got back from the accountants doing the uh, tax return. Uh, got a lot to do still though, uh, so racing the sunset a little bit. Doing some welding here, just trying to get this all ready and painted. So when John comes in the morning, we can start playing with some of the new gear. So wish me luck. Didn't get anywhere near as far as I'd hoped last night. So early to bed, early to rise. Uh, really cold morning this morning actually. I think I should head north. When I welded the mount for the radar, I made an effort to put way too much heat into it so that it got a bit of a curve on it and the uh, water wouldn't pull. That's a feature, not a fault. With regards to mounting the camera, I was thinking this might be too low, but it's actually not much more than you see the bow rail of the boat. And it's not really about seeing what's two feet in front of you, it's about the view ahead with the AIS and the augmented reality stuff. So I'm thinking under the radar will be fine. So easiest way to do this is going to be to place the mount where we want, mark it, drill right through, and then screw it in from below. All right, because this is bare steel and I am using self-tappers to screw into it, I'm gonna put some retaining compound for both corrosion prevention and to stop the screws coming undone. Not that I think they're gonna fall out of steel that they've tapped into, but better safe than sorry. 
I've got to put the cable through the channel on the underside first before I put it up. Feed the cable and let's start in the slots and rotate till it faces forward. Last thing you do is this little Allen key grub screw that stops it from backing out and coming out. So if you want to remove it, you just back that out, rotate it. Lots of really cool things about this camera. Uh, all the augmented reality stuff, which you'll see in a second, but also it is essentially a webcam. So I can use this for uh, security, uh, streaming, recording for the channel, all sorts of stuff. It's a low light camera, but fundamentally it's quite a good high frame rate, high resolution color camera. We'll also be putting a lower resolution, low frame rate infrared camera on, which is more a safety camera, but this will be good for the channel and for navigation. Big moment now, we're going to uh, install the radar. John is here again. <laughs> Morning, John. <laughs> so we are going to run our cables down here. Nick, uh, who is also here, and David, say hi David, and uh, all from Rain Ring. Um, Nick just asked me if I color coded my pull cables so we knew which one to pull and I thought, oh, that's a good idea. Anyway, so I said, silver one's a Raymarine, but <laughs> it's not gonna help. So what we'll do is I will probably just give it a little, and then you tell me which one, and you'll know which one it is and then we'll go from there. And this is gonna be great having a couple of people downstairs and a couple up. So this is our biggest plug yeah. that has to go down. So this is the... Yeah, so that's the, we call it Raynet, that round yep. connector. That's like a network connection. Yep. So we're going to use the... So hard... that's Ethernet essentially, but your yeah, yeah. your marinized version of... Correct, yeah. yeah. You know, something a bit more suitable for a marine environment. Yep, so, than yeah. the standard. Again, yeah. a moulded cable, but being terminated at both ends, we need to pull that larger plug through. Mm -hmm. A bit inconvenient, but the long term is it's reliable. Yes. So we're going to pull that one down first. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second plug for the radar is the power supply. Mm -hmm. uh, the other end of that is bare wire. So that one's going to be a little easier. We can pull that through second. Yep. Uh, and then our other consideration is for the camera. Yeah, camera. Pulling a little bit. Can you see one moving at all? One of them moving. Okay. 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 Good. So can you try pulling that one? Uh, hang on. I just got to make sure to take the other one with it. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. So I was just pulling that one backwards because it was going with it. John's just suggested that we pull the power cable for the radar and the original pull cable through and then just leave it there for future use. Thinking ahead, it's not something I'm very good at. <laughs> <laughs> for a needs of John in their life. <laughs> quite exciting, I've never owned a boat with radar. Uh, actually, when you're pulling Raynet cables, there is actually an accessory that Raymarine have. Yeah which screws into, into the clever. end of the Raynet cable That's and then you can clever. use a, a mouse line so you can gently pull it through that's using a great the idea. not having to do the tape, especially yeah. if you had a really tight conduit. Yeah, that's a great um, idea. What a cool little accessory just there. <laughs> yeah. Gently, we're going through the bend now. Yeah, this is the sort of tricky bit. I'm just going to, oh, there we go. Oh. So, after a bit of a struggle, we finally have uh, Ethernet for the camera, power for the camera, power for the radar and the Raynet for the radar. I'm going to connect the radar cables to the underside of the radar and then we'll get that bolted on as well. A really important point is this is a bit of a Gore-Tex drain point for any moisture that may gather in the unit and there's a big hole in the mounting plate there so that water doesn't get trapped in there. Okay, data cable, a couple of guides so we know which way around it goes bit of paint on it, because none of the paint's dry yet. Comes through, ooh, look at that. That's pretty cool. And the power cable. Okay, so here we're having a look at all that. Now to get into here, of course, it's back to the home screen yep. settings network and we can see the list of devices that we have set up here so we've got two heading sensors and they have different methods to calibrate so the first mm -hmm. one's the ar200 and that's mm -hmm. for our augmented reality so we would we would select the item in the list and we can see we've got a couple of options here now the one of interest is calibrate um, 
as we measured the other day because we had a poor position for that we had a very very high deviation value mm -hmm. i've gone ahead and pressed the reset button so we're back to zero so it's ready to learn that again. for the pilot again we're into the settings but we're going to go to the autopilot menu and we turn on pilot control mm -hmm. um, we get a warning box and of course we click ok without reading as we normally do um, but so what we're doing is we're allowing pilot control from the multifunction display. So this is like right. a, this is a headless pilot system where we don't yep. have a dedicated pilot controller. This is not a complete pilot. This is only the EV1 sensor, which mm -hmm. is the heading yep. sensor for pitch and roll and other things. Yep. Um, but it's also the course computer. So it mm -hmm. determines the course calculations. When you get your uh, ACU and mm -hmm. your drive unit in, then it will be a fully functional pilot. So those smarts are actually in the EV1 up there, are the they? The EV1 yeah, sensor. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So the idea is that there's a certain amount of bandwidth that you can pass up the NMEA 2000 network, mm -hmm. um, and that means that our course calculations are going to be restricted by that. Mm -hmm. So it was determined many oh, years ago, about okay. 2011 or so, that by putting the course computer brain and the heading sensor all in the one unit that we can send it across it's the got really high bandwidth between those two yeah, and then four times the bandwidth yeah okay nice. so you can get a much faster refresh rate and, mm -hmm. and more accurate mm -hmm. course calculation so so what we've done we turned on the pilot control we're going to go into the pilot setup and here we've got a whole number of different Set settings in here, Dockside Wizard we, we can do once we've got the rest of the equipment in the boat. Gotcha, yeah. But what we're interested in at the moment is um, the compass. So we're going to make sure the compass lock is off. Uh, right. We can restart the compass and we can start learning that data. Once it once we, we finish that learning process, then we'll receive that total deviation number. We also need to align the heading to the vessel, although yep. your precision installation would mean that they're perfect. We just need to fine tune the AR heading and the EV heading, mm -hmm. but the hierarchy that I think you overheard me talking about earlier mm -hmm. is that you do your bearing alignment for your radar first, Okay. then you do it for your heading sensors, okay. so the pilot heading or the AR heading. Yep. Okay. So we can actually go about doing that, that's okay, more cool. practical. Yep. Get out there and line it up with something in the that, real that's world. It. You can align to GPS, um, which if you've got perfect conditions, that one works well. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've got our own sort of method that we use. Okay. Line yep. of sight with a with a charted object and that sort of thing, which nice. we find is more accurate, especially you've got current flows and other things affecting Yes, you. gotcha. Yep. Okay. Yeah, true, because you could be crabbing through the water and all sorts yeah, of... That's yeah. it. So course over ground is yeah. what it is. Yep. Whereas heading's not... Yeah, mm. heading is the orientation of the vessel, mm -hmm. where course over ground is a, a couple of set points, mm -hmm. and then you draw that line between them, yeah. and that's, you know, if we continue, that's where we're going to end up, but as we know, we've got breeze or weather conditions, that vessel's going to change its angle. Yeah. So we, need to fi we need to finish up a bit of this. Bit of network cabling now. We've got a bit to connect up. So this I haven't actually shown yet, I don't think. So this is the SeaTalk network switch, which is essentially marinized ethernet. Yeah, man. Uh, so it'll take the sort of the you know 12 to 14 volt or whatever it is you know so it's not as fussy about its input voltage yeah and uh waterproof connectors and locking connectors and all that kind of good stuff so we need to get and and obviously so our high bandwidth items go through here because NMEA or SeaTalk's not high enough bandwidth for cameras, radar. That's right. It, yeah. It's good at sharing data items, mm -hmm. a number or something like that. Yep. But if we actually need to share some sort of image or some, mm -hmm. some larger bandwidth, then we'd really need to send that up here. Yeah. So the other thing about this is it, it can be powered from the network, and you'll see this is noted as a 12, oh, 24, 24 volt nice. DC. Now, there, yep. is, there is a difference. So you can have a marine object, or mm -hmm. have you want to refer to it, uh, and it will have an acceptable range of 8 or 9 or 10 volts through to the 30 volts or whatever mm -hmm. is specified. They can be a broad range, mm -hmm. but most devices are 12 or 24, yep. accepting voltage within that range. So yes. 20 volts is a low volt condition on a 24 volt right, yes. system or at a very high volt oversupply on a, on yep. a 12 volt. Yep. So if we fall in that in-between zone, you can get unexpected and, outcomes. And also I've had things that are not designed for a boat that were 12 to 24, and as soon as you turn the boat on and you're charging at 27, it blew up. Yeah. <laughs> like it, that was actually the range. It wasn't saying it was 12 or 24. It was, yeah. that was it. Yeah. yeah, we provide the power to the unit. 
and then we can plug our various devices in, multifunction display, radar, thermal camera, other cameras, whatever other devices we have. Mm -hmm. And if we run out of ports on here, we can then link to another switch. And uh, we can, using we can, the 10 gig yeah, port so, to, to so link. Port number five is one gig. Oh, one gig, sorry, yes. And then port one through to four are 100 yeah. meg. 100 meg, sorry, that's it. So 100 meg, yeah. So a lot of marine devices are 100 meg. Yep. Um, and then some, some devices are starting to move into the one gig. Mm -hmm. um, there's not that file transfer or anything that you have in your home yeah. network, so the one gig yeah. hasn't been a necessity. Mm -hmm. So then, yeah, you use that one gig link to go to your second switch, mm -hmm. and you get another four ports available for you to yeah. use, and okay. so on. On the day, John and I headed out and did a bearing alignment on the radar installation, but being the uh, true professional I am, I managed to lose that footage, so I'll show you how it's done now. Damien and Jess from Project Brewpig came out with me to help out with the radar alignment and also help doing the filming, so thanks very much for that, guys. Turned on order acquisition for targets. We'll see if we can get this uh, tugboat that's coming from ahead of us to show up as an automatically identified target and start tracking it. Here we go, target number one, looks like it. The reason I know it's number three is it's red, which means the Doppler radar is saying that it's moving and moving towards us. If it's moving away from us, it would be green. It's also giving us a vector for number three. I can actually see why people go to manual. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go turn off auto and then manually acquire just the tugboat. Automatic acquisition would work well offshore, but obviously not a great choice when you're still inside a busy harbour. Uh, so also if I go to him now, yeah. do a context menu, do more, you could say track with camera. And right. the camera will point straight at him the whole time. It's pretty cool. cool. It yeah. is pretty cool. Right, so that's the name of the boat, Kibble Bay. Yeah. Right, so, so basically it's the camera pointing, as we go past it, the camera should continue to track it. So it's pulling out AIS data as well. Yep, so it's AIS plus infrared plus radar. Wow, that's amazing. It's pretty cool. Isn't that it? is really cool. Yeah. So it's basically bracketed the nav aid yeah. so we don't hit that, and yeah. then bracketed the boat we're tracking. Right. I'm just going to come on the left hand side of this aid. But you can see how that would be so cool at night. We go, oh, there's something on my radar. Yeah. It's coming near me. Yeah. I'm going to. Uh, I just want to track it with the camera. Ace, so I can find out what it is. Yeah. Yeah, I reckon that's actually a night, a really nice night vision mode. Is yeah, camera, infrared camera and radar together. 750 feet. You'd never think that was 750 feet. I would have thought that'd be like 300, 200. Yeah. Right. We can also go to this and then uh, bring our range down a little bit. Right, so the camera's spinning around catching it. See the exhaust yeah, line on it too? That's awesome. Yeah, so the camera will just track it constantly. To check the bearing alignment of the radar, I changed to a chart view, then zoomed right in and added a layer that superimposed the radar over the top of the chart. Strictly this isn't necessary, but it just gave us a sense of what we were pointing at. It's also important to note that just because, uh, say a nav aid, for example, is in front of you on the chart, doesn't mean it's in the correct position. It's great when you do see a radar blob superimposed over where the chart indicates something should be, but things do move. Piles get lifted by contractors, put in you know slightly wrong places, so don't trust the chart location to be gospel. So you can see here these port and starboard markers are showing up. Yeah, right. So that's the two markers marking the channel. So that's radar pulling that out? Yes. Yeah. So what we want to do is point straight at that port marker. Now we've got both 
both of them. And we are aiming pretty much at the starboard one, aren't we? Yep, you yeah, happy with that one? Yep. And so let's have a look. It's a little... So, yep. So when I look down the centre of the boat through here, yep. our heading line was right through the radar target. Right. So we know that the radar's not. It's perfectly aligned to the boat's heading. Right. Okay. And I think it's really just compensating for if you had installed it on its bracket, just not straight. Yeah, right. That's really what it comes down to. With the alignment confirmed, we took a moment just to relax and enjoy the sunshine for a change. Yeah, all right, we're going to time it. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a bit of, oh, we've got a bit of one now. No, she's right. Go. A bit of waves, give us not that one. I'm going to use the seat for I mean, that's how you do it. That is pretty good. That is pretty good. <laughs> good. I like four strokes. They're just quieter. Two strokes are better. Say that. Time for a trick shot. How many nautical miles? Nobody ah, expected. Oh, that was disappointing. How many nautical miles have you done in your Cummins? That's not really important. I didn't even touch it. When I got to <laughs> the last full standing. <laughs> trick shot off the buffer here into there. All right. <laughs> or that one. Oh. <laughs> he parked it. <laughs> <laughs> why is why is pull easier on a boat than on land? It's more fun on a boat. Yeah, it is more fun on a boat. You don't even need alcohol to be an awesome player. That's it. Three, two, one. Count. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Time to head back to the marina and show you how you would adjust the alignment if it had been out. While we were out on the water, Damien and I were able to confirm that our bearing alignment is actually correct, but I'll show you the setting to change it if it wasn't correct. Go into your radar app, go to your menus, settings down the bottom, and then there's an installation tab. And here you get a chance to change this bearing alignment and move the line, either negative or positive, until your heading line goes directly through the target that's directly in front of you. In this case, we've got it zero because the radar dome's installed facing forward. If it had been installed a little bit, you know, a little bit wonky, you can just compensate in software. So that's all you need to do. Well, thanks for watching. I'm gonna get on now and edit that uh, video on leads that I promised you. And then in a few days, we'll be on the hard stand and finally getting all the rust repaired on Renko and the hull painted. All right, I'll catch you soon. See ya.